Welcome to the Yo Brother Podcast with hosts Dan and Mike Smith, brothers from the same mother with different opinions on movies, TV, video games, and more, plus celebrity interviews. Get ready, get set, it's time for the Yo Brother Podcast. Ryan. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how you doing, man? Good. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate you know we <laughs> a couple of failed attempts to <laughs> to talk. I, we got sick, you got sick. It's like trying to coordinate calendars and yeah. How did yeah. you make out? You uh, you got the old uh, the old COVID there. Yeah, I, that came out of nowhere. I didn't. I just I thought I was immune to COVID by this at this point. I was just on the show and we were getting tested like every every day, oh, every right. other day. And I was traveling a lot. I mean, I was all over the place and no COVID. Then I came back and I've just been sitting in my house for a couple of weeks and I got COVID. I don't, <laughs> I, don't I don't know how that worked. So the mailman or something maybe? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Did you, I mean, was it pretty mild? Yeah. I mean, I had a lot, but my throat was really sore, but yeah. I didn't have a fever or anything. Like I felt fine just to go about living my life, but uh, so I knew something wasn't right, and then I tested, and then immediately after that, I kind of had a sore throat, so it was kind of hard to talk for any length of time. But other than that, I really just set up around my house reorganizing stuff because I just because I was just shut in, I guess. Right. Well, you were productive then. That's good. That's a- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty. It was pretty mild on, on my end too. It was uh, you know pretty fortunate. It could have been a lot worse. Like you said, you, you know, it's a good opportunity to. to you know, get to some other projects or, or whatever. Yeah. So it was, it was just funny. I got it last year for New Year's, and I got oh it really Christmas. Wow, but you're covering year, all the holidays. Yeah, I know. I, but last year wasn't quite as bad because my girlfriend got it at the same time. So oh, she nice. and I just sat around and played Legend of Zelda. And- it's a it's <laughs> a very COVID Christmas. <laughs> yeah. So it's good to meet you. Now, what, good morning, I guess. What are you on the West Coast? Are you in like California or something? Or yeah. I'm in, I'm in LA. You're in LA, of course. Yeah. Where else would you be, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was thinking too, um, it kind of prepping for this interview. You know, you're getting half of the O Brother podcast, but between you and me, it's really the only half that matters. Uh, <laughs> you know, Mike's schedule wasn't wasn't lining up, but um if you you know, I looked and I thought your resume is really long. Like you've been at this a long time and yeah. worn a lot of different hats. And want to get into Christmas, bloody Christmas, of course. And I've seen it twice now. And I was just listening to your track, which is, I mean, basically the the title track of the film, right? I mean, that's fair to say, oh, isn't yeah. it? Bloody Christmas. Yeah. So we got to talk about that too. But can you, can you start? We like to always sort of kind of get into like, what was your journey into filmmaking? How did that, you know, take us back and talk a little bit about how that started? Uh. I, I guess really, I, my dad was was a photographer, and that kind of led me down. That that, that was the first thing. Um, I I just grew up in a studio, so I knew camera stuff. I didn't think I was going to be a photographer necessarily. I just knew how it worked, mm-hmm. um, and I was in his darkroom all the time. But I really kind of saw myself more going down, like being an engineer. Um, but I liked art, and I wanted to find a way to merge art and technology together. And then I discovered movies, and that was kind of um by accident i uh i'm from a very small town where like we get the blockbusters and i mean that's about it like like the whatever big movie comes out we have about three of those and then they just rotate whatever they're sending to the theater in my hometown so i never saw any like uh, art house stuff or anything like that until maybe i was at a friend's house or we rented it or i don't remember how i saw it but somehow i ended up seeing blue velvet Mm. and i was like holy shit. I didn't know that. I didn't know that you could just go make movies if you wanted to. I thought there was, there was this massive machine behind all movies got made. I mean, blue Velvet's still a pretty big movie, but I mean, it was small in comparison to what I had seen before that. And I, uh, saw that and I was like, well, I, I think that I understand technology or have an interest in technology and I understand how cameras work and, maybe and i realized that there are these different roles that these people have on to make these movies maybe i could fit into that somewhere and use the part of my brain that likes to 
solve technical issues and mm. then also use the other part of my brain that likes composition and color so um that's kind of how it all started and then after that it was just a long journey i've moved around all over the place i lived in chicago for a long time um i lived in central florida going to school i don't know if you remember but i like maybe i don't know how long 20 years ago now yeah. longer o- over 20 years maybe 23 or four years ago there was a hurricane called hurricane opal and hurricane opal just decimated i'm from panama city okay so it just decimated everything so yeah. they had this thing where they were just finding people jobs and at the time i was just out of high school and was just working in restaurants and i ended up getting placed in a uh, a human re- as a human resource worker in a detox center wow and i was 19 or 18 and i was admitting patients from 12 at night to 8 in the morning and uh one of the nurses there i just at night i mean there was nothing to do like we would get maybe we would get one person a night that i would just have to admit which was I mean, that's a whole nother story being, mm-hmm. <laughs> being some, being some punk rock kid working at a detox center, admitting <laughs> like old guys that were just like, I mean, losing their minds. But anyway, so there was a nurse there and her husband had a job where he went around Florida and, and would evaluate different schools. And a lot of it was um, community colleges and stuff like that. And I was talking to her about kind of what I wanted to do. And she's like, Oh, my husband, does this thing and he was just sat in orlando and they have a community college that supposedly has a very good film program Mm -hmm. so i decided to go and the prerequisite for their film program is their theater program Mm -hmm. and when i got there i i had never been in a theater i didn't know i mean my hometown i don't think that they had a theater program in any of the schools that were there now where's the home where did you grow up panama city oh that's where you grew up okay yeah yeah So uh, I got into the theater program and ended up really liking it a lot. Um, And I realized that the film program was not really the program I wanted. Um, At the time the movie Jeepers Creepers was being made. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the kids that were in that program were PAing on Jeepers Creepers or doing art department stuff. And I just didn't want to go to school to, to, I knew that I didn't want to go in to be a PA. Like I wanted, if I was going to go to school, I wanted to focus on cinematography and they didn't have that program. And I was learning a lot in theater. So I just stayed in theater and worked as an electrician and did lighting and stuff in theater for several years until I moved mm-hmm. to Chicago. It's, yeah. So you really got a, a, a good foundation. Then. Yeah. I mean, I loved it. I built props. We built flats. I mean, all the technology and all the terminology that I would come to learn and film originated in theater i mean they call it slightly different things and the construction somewhat different but the the instructor that we had there i think his name was mike shug or mike yeah absolutely sure he uh would he would he knew what people were doing there Mm -hmm. and while he really wanted to prop up the theater department and get kids excited about theater he also knew a lot of them were going into film so he made it he made a point of always going well this is what this is the theatrical flat Mm -hmm. and this is a stage flat or whatever so we would go through and we would learn the differences between things like that and it was pretty basic but it but uh i wasn't going and getting coffee for anyone i was actually physically building things and making things and had a part and at the time i really thought like I, at, the, at the time i was besides cinematography i was very interested in like dennis murin and phil tippett mm-hmm. and um in the cinematography special effects people that had their foundation in cinematography. And that's like Star Wars, right? With the, yeah, yeah. the model makers and all that. Right. And yeah. uh, like Dragon Lance, um, right. Dragon Slayer was a, was a, one of the first go motion, stop motion movies that merged live action and stop motion. And, and that sort of stuff is what I was interested in. He knew that. So like we did Dracula and Faust and I did all the mechanical props and pyrotechnics and things like that, which has nothing to do with, camera work necessarily but i think it set up the foundation of like how how to do these these tricks mm-hmm. what uh, i was excited about so anyway, yeah, and, that's a long one to answer to that no kind of no it's it's thing. super interesting i mean i this is again i think this is one of the things we're most fascinated by when we speak to folks in the business is that journey it's just so it's so varied it's so diverse and different with every person that you talk to you go to chicago and you said you were there for quite a long time so what's that whole journey like there in chicago um well yeah i was there about seven years and i would have stayed i love chicago it's it's Mm -hmm. an amazing city um but 
I've always also always been in bands and my very good friend that I grew up with, uh, he was in Orlando too. He went to full sale for their audio program. Well, I went down, talked him into coming down. He ended up going through this audio program. He's an audio engineer and a producer. And he, uh, and he spent about 10 times more than you to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Full sale is not cheap. No. Um, yeah. So he did that and he, uh, he ended up moving to Chicago just through people that he was graduating with, I think. Mm-hmm. And he was trying to get me to come up and he's like, come, come up to Chicago. We'll start another band. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. I was just over, over Orlando and over Florida. Um, and they have a bunch of theaters there. So I figured I could find work. But the other part is they have Columbia, which has a cinematography concentration. And I was mm-hmm. also looking at RISD and a couple of other schools that had film programs that I thought would be the next step for me. Mm-hmm. But I really wanted to go to a school that had a, a, a dedicated concentration in cinematography. So I knew that I could just be moving in that direction and using the lighting stuff that I had already learned and also start practicing more in just the camera department. So I went up there to be in a band, but so I could, but I also went so I could try to apply to get into Valencia or get into Columbia. And I mm-hmm. took a little while, but I ended up doing both those things. Um, and then once I graduated, I love Chicago, but at the time there just wasn't that much work. Like there's a handful of like, I was working as a camera assistant and electrician. And if the people above you weren't working, then that meant you weren't working and there weren't that many jobs there. So they got gobbled up pretty quickly. So I was looking mm-hmm. at New York or LA and I only ended, I was going to go to New York. I only ended up in LA because I knew two people mm. and those two people were like, come to LA. We'll help you get work. And so I went to LA. I'd never actually been West of like Arkansas and I ended up going to LA. And you've been there since. Yeah. I mean, I've traveled around a lot for work, Sure, um, but yeah, I've been here since then. Now, when did you form the band? Is it, it's, is it death crew? Oh, Death Crux. That's a Death that's, Crux. Yeah, that's a different one that I I was here for. That, so uh, I moved out here because I thought I needed to do that for work. And I had a lot of good friends that also came out that I went to school with and people in the industry. But yeah. I didn't really have any like social, just like friends outside of that or people that I didn't go to school with. And like I said, I've been in bands forever. So that wasn't something that was important to me. And I just could not find that that world here even though I've come surrounded by it. Um, and my friend Sanford, the one who taught me to go into Chicago came to visit me and we're ha- having this conversation on the sidewalk. And I was just like, I cannot find people that want to do what I want to do. And this other dude was walking down the sidewalk towards us no and way. Sanford turned around and knew him and goes here, just be friends with Aaron. And that's how I met this guy. And then he and I started talking and we became friends and we ended up starting this band and, it was just very kind of funny how that's kind of cosmic. Yeah. How things just work out that way. Now, was it music first? Was that kind of your first love? Like growing up was, were you Did you gravitate towards that art form first? Yeah. 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 Ph- photography. I think I just took for granted because I was sitting in the middle of it all the time. And um, did you, was your dad, was that his profession? Was he working at that photography? Yeah. Yeah. He had a small studio but like I said, the town was so small. It was a lot of uh, brochure and ad work and mm. weddings and just like whatever he could find. He right. did a lot of magazine and, and uh, ads for the beach because there's so many businesses like sell Panama hey, that, that, and, That's how Kubrick got started. So, yeah. yeah. So he did that. But yeah, music was my first thing. I originally, before film, I actually did go to school for a little bit for, for jazz, for composition and theory for. Oh, wow. Days. But I realized I was in way, way in over my head. The kids I was going to school with came from all over the world mm-hmm. and they were, they were phenomenal. And I just like, this is, I, I love metal. I, I love music and heavy metal and old punk rock stuff, but, and I love jazz too. And I really wanted to be a part of that, but I realized I was just kind of in over my head. And I don't, I don't think that that was really the profession that I felt like I needed to be in. Um, mm. I'm kind of being an amateur musician and, collecting records <laughs> yeah it's kind of where you know i play a little guitar enough to humor myself and you know at some point as you're getting older you're like okay it's a one in a billion thing to make you know a yeah. career at it etc cetera, etc cetera. and so you you know you kind of you, you resign yourself to say yeah it, you know as long as i can still 
engage in it and enjoy it. You know, and it makes me happy. It doesn't have to be my full-time gig, but yeah. you know, well, that was one of my big thoughts. And I think that this applies to a lot of things in life is like, I didn't want to make it a job. And that was the thing that I saw when I was at that school, these, these kids, while they were all brilliant and amazing musicians, but they were going to they were going to get paid to play someone mm -hmm. else's music. And maybe it's music they wanted to play. Sure. But maybe they would also be writing. I mean, there's no, there's no limitation on what you, you can and can't do on your off time. Mm -hmm. So maybe they, maybe they could have done that, done those things. I just didn't see myself doing that if I went down that route. And now, I mean, I like weird, weird stuff. And if I want to make it, I can. And there's, and, and I've found that I've heard this all the time for film. It's a little bit trickier because there's so much, <laughs> I mean, it's easier now than ever, but it's just hard to get to make things sometimes because you need help and it takes mm -hmm. more money with music. Yeah. It takes very little. And if you, if you like super slow doom, doom music, you can, you can make it and there'll, there'll be an audience somewhere. Someone will, will help support you. And it's the same thing. When we started death Brooks. I'd never been in a band where you, we actually had real singing and we decided we wanted to do that and try it and and it and it worked out i mean it's not huge but when uh with when, how it ties into to uh christmas bloody christmas is we made the movie and joe had songs that he wanted that he heard being in the song or being in the movie mm -hmm. but now joe joe bagos is that right yeah, yeah yeah um but music's just very expensive and sometimes you just can't get it. Like they just won't, they won't let you have it or they just make it so expensive that there's no way you're ever going to get it. And, um, and so we had some stuff that he was trying to get. And I was, and once we got done shooting, like this wasn't even a thought while we were doing it, but I was just got back to LA after we were done. And I was like, called him. I was like, Hey, I really want to try and write a song, a Christmas song for the movie. <laughs> are, are you open to that? And he goes, yeah, sure. I mean, Joe's very good about, including his friends like if you look at his movies yes. there's a handful of actors that are in in all of them mm -hmm. like, even if it's a very small part he likes working with his friends he likes to keep things very small and intimate and so i asked him he's like yeah sure just make something and let me hear it so i demoed it here at my in my house and had the guys come over and we each kind of went through things and until we got it done and it's a very simple song um and then i sent it over to him and he liked it and they ended up placing it in the movie while they're editing. It's just like a temp. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, if you want to do it, we need the, the final version. So we were like scrambling to get into the studio to record the song. Um, you know, and, and, and it's just, it's cool that, that, that it made it in there. Like I said, it's it, for me being a cinematographer who got to have a song in a movie was, was a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I didn't know that that was a goal until, I saw it as being a possibility and then it became a goal. So, well, I saw your post on Instagram standing in front of the marquee. Yeah. You know, and then that's, I think that's kind of what you said in that post. Yeah. And yeah. That's was, a, it's a great representation of the two of your two loves, you know, those two passions. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, like I said, it's, it's nice cause I don't have any real expectation for what music is going to be. Cause I really want it to be for me, mm -hmm. but um, it's nice when it merges with my other, other parts of my life. It's a big deal. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll be there long before we're, you know, or long after we're gone, you know, so that that's, it's very cool. Now, you know, talk a little bit about, um, because again, looking at your resume, you've worked on a numerous television series and one that stood out to me that I don't know that I finished, but Moonbase eight, right. When you did some you know, camera operator work on that. Yeah, um, that was with my friend Carl, Carl Hersey. He and I went, he was one of the two that, so that I knew two people in LA. One of them was BJ McDonald, who is a steady cam operator, and now he's a director. Um, I knew BJ because I met him in Chicago working on this weird art film. And Carl was my TA in a lighting class. And we just became friends. And those were the two people who lived here and taught me into coming out here. So I worked with Carl as an operator for, for a long time. And, um, I ended up leaving that show early because I was, I just had been trying to, sh I want to, I want to be a DP. That was the whole goal was to shoot. And while I love operating, I just, I, I end up, I keep leaving jobs because I get jobs to, sh to work as a, to, as a DP. Mm -hmm. So I was on moon base and I think I worked on about two thirds of it maybe, mm -hmm. and then, or maybe most of it up to the last episode. I didn't finish it because I ended up getting another job and left to go shoot a movie. Um, 
So, yeah. Now, Christmas Bloody Christmas is not, it's not your first feature as a cinematographer, right? No, it's technically my fifth, I think. Fourth or fifth. fifth. Okay. Fifth. Can you, can you touch a little, cause the reason I brought that up, I wanted you, you know, for those that don't know, and, and this is something we're always learning about the behind the scenes stuff, but camera operator versus DP, you know, what are the, what are the differences there? Um, well, as a DP, you're, you're the, you're controlling grip and lighting and camera. You're working directly with the director. You're also working with the art department in some, in some capacity. Um, uh, there's an art director or, or production designer. Well, so the, I, I don't know if anyone ever uses this term anymore, but when I was first coming up, uh, actually at Valencia, I think Mike said this phrase, but he's like, there's like this Holy Trinity, which is the director, the director of photography and the production designer. Obviously, there's there's a lot more people than those three people, but those are the three big ones. And as far as like a look of a movie, because you have the costume designer who's also working in tandem with the production designer. I mean, they don't they costume designer doesn't work under them, but they work in tandem mm -hmm. just to get the look of the film. And then the product and then the dir director of photography is working with the director to try to visualize and to interpret the director's vision on how that's what's that what does it really look like what mm -hmm. what is it actually and then we're working with the production designer in, to make sure that colors are going to stay the same color that they need to be that textures and things like you see all those things so everybody's working in tandem but the, the director of photography is in control of the camera department um it's he also runs the grip and the lighting department and grip department if you think of a lighting department as being the person who makes light the grip department is the person who shapes that light so now is, does that even, does that come into play with, if I think about the film, you know, these certain sequences, particularly, I guess it's in, I think it's in the title sequence where, which is very cool and very nostalgic looking feel to it, where there's, they're showing very, almost like seventies vibe commercials and things on the, on the TV. Um, is that something that you're somehow involved in of how the look of those shots even though they're not. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean? they were, well, kind of. Sort um, of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I shot those and I'm in one of them. I'm in two of them. Actually. Oh, yeah. oh, see, I thought I, okay. Um, we did that in Joe's apartment. It was just me and Joe and a couple of friends came over, but the idea is they were, it was supposed to look like a public access channel. Right. And so we, we shot everything else on film that we shot with, my 7d i think i had some old camera i don't remember what no we used jo josh has a some we used some digital camera that was just there didn't even oh. matter what it was so we just took a digital camera and shot the shot the slim jinko commercial and shot all the like as you're like scrolling through channels and then after that they edited it and did the color correction on it to make it look all wacky with the reverse colors and stuff and they gave it to me and I put it on my television here at home and I shot the television with the film camera. Oh, that's cool. So it wouldn't, it would look like we shot a public access channel. That's so cool. It, it didn't look like the movie, but it still had a, a similar texture. That's neat. But uh, so, yeah, I was involved with that too. So how that differs from being a camera operator is a camera operator works underneath the DP as solely an, an operator. And, and well, the, the goal of an operator is kind of a little bit, um uh different for different productions kind of depends on what the, the director and the producer and the dp want from that operator mm -hmm. i mean you could be there as much just to sit there and point the camera at whatever's happening or a lot of times like if you're an a camera operator um like i was i was just on um uh 1923 which is a huge show oh yeah and the a operator for that show does a lot more work because there's a lot of cameras and he's been with the DP for a lot, for many years. So Ben would go around and set up the shots that he wants and says, this is the shot. This is the shot. This is a shot B shot. I mean, we had all the way to F camera. There's so many cameras. So he goes through and places all the camera positions. And then he goes and he works with the actors because he also directs. So he works with them or he works with the lighting department um, and starts shaping the rest of those, this world in. While that's all happening, the A camera operator would go up and he would make sure that this camera that was just kind of loosely placed is getting what it should be getting, which means that he would go and work with the art department, like the set dressers, to make sure that there's not coffee cups in the background 
or that the lamp isn't covering the actor's face when they step around into their two position or whatever. So you're working with the art department, you're working with the actors to make sure their eye lines are right, um, that they can actually see their eye line. And mm -hmm. there's not something like a flag or a person standing where the actor should be looking. So you're kind of managing the actual physical set in regards to what is actually being shot. And that's kind of, the, the bulk of responsibility. And also if it's a camera move, you're looking at where it starts and where it ends and then make sure you're not shooting off the set mm -hmm. or seeing the boom operator or a grip that's just chilling in the background. I mean, you, you just want to make, it's making sure that, that the shot is perfect. Your goal is only what is in the frame, making sure that the, the move is right and that it's the best it can possibly be. And a lot of times DPs, I like, I like to operate for myself when I'm shooting, but a lot of times if you have multiple cameras, you just you can't because you want to be able to see all of them. And if you're operating one camera, you can't see what B, C, D, and E are doing. So Right, right. That's great insight. I mean, it, it's second nature to you, but to me, I'm like, oh, okay. So when I watch the credits and I see A camera operator, Joe and B, Brian, you know, okay. It, it yeah. starts to make more sense now. So how do you get connected with, with Joe, the, the director? Now he wrote, produced, and directed the film. Yeah, he also he was the A operator. He loved and he was the A operator. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of debate whether a director should operate, but Joe <laughs> loves to do it, and that's his method, and so that's what he does. And I think that he and I was somewhat skeptical going into it because I've seen it not go so well a lot most of the time. What's but, usually the con, or you know, the risk with that? Uh, actors want your attention, ah. and and also when your eyes in an eyepiece or looking at a monitor this big, you're like hyper-focused on the move. And I think that you can miss performance beats. Like if something is very, like when you have a monitor that's a 17 inch monitor and you're sitting there and you're, and you're lit with headphones on, listening to the words, watching their faces, getting invested in the performance, you, I think you can get more out of actors. I think mm -hmm. you can also, um, see flaws or see things that need to be fixed uh right away if you're on a camera running around it, it you're concerned about the shot i think and a lot of times you miss things miss subtleties that you would pick up on if you weren't having to worry about the physicality of the camera as well um so anyway i was i was apprehensive but joe has always done it that way mm -hmm. and he's really good at doing it that way and i would i would he would catch things that i wouldn't catch and he would run over and he would talk to them and he would run back at the end of the day, it's him doing a lot of running, but that's what he likes doing. He likes the physicality of it, so that's what he that's how he that's how he likes to work. Um, but yeah, and you and how did you how did you get connected with him? Had you worked with him oh, before? I, I, no, okay. I, well, I've known Joe for a long time, so I knew I met Josh Josh Ethier uh, years ago, and uh, Josh has just been a really big. We're just friends, and we met each other because we like the same music. Like I had, I had a camera card at the time and I had stickers on it and he was like, Oh, neurosis. I like neurosis too. So we started talking and he ended up knowing the band that I was in in Chicago and we just became friends. And, uh, he's been a pretty big advocate for me for most of my career. A lot of the movies I've got have been as a result of Josh introducing me to those directors because Josh works as an editor as well. And he's just worked mm -hmm. with a bunch of people and, um, he and Joe, came up together. They grew up in Rhode Island together and moved out here together and started channel 83 together. And they're the two main, the only two entities involved with 80, channel 83 full time. Okay. okay. Yeah. I grew up just North of Boston. So not, not too far away. Um, so talk about the, the Christmas lighting technique that you use to light. The, I mean, it's, and I want to ask you too, what is it about Christmas lights? Now, I, I grew up in New England, very stereotypical, you know, the look and all of that. Yeah. But what is it to us about that? Do you have any thoughts on what is it about Christmas lights? No, I. It's kind of fascinating when you start to think about it. Yeah, you know, it's, I haven't I haven't really thought that, that deeply into it. I mean, I think a lot of it is just the the it happens once a year so and it happens as when you're a kid so there's something nostalgic about it True. it's a very very different it's a very specific look it connects with memories and all kinds of things yeah. i mean i think that's what a lot of it is um outside of the memory aspect of it i mean i think it also just having lighting up a night being lit at night 
that's not street lights. Like, I mean, think I just <laughs> I just pictured in my head, I just pictured like a very desolate street with street lights. You go, I don't want to walk down that street. Right. You see one lit by Christmas lights. You're like, oh, huh, this one. Yeah, it must be friendly. Place. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that there's I mean, maybe that also goes back to memory because you associate it with something good. Mm -hmm. But um, there is there's something magical, I think, about these uh, uh, undulating lights and the colors in these dark environments that feel somewhat magical. And I mean, also, I, I mean, I guess all those things are learned, learned responses to the to it. But um I think that goes a long way. Um, as far as the lighting in the movie goes, we knew we were going to, we were going to try to put Christmas lights on everything. And Joe from previous movies had found this neon lighting that he likes a lot. I was going to say it's like Christmas lights and neon lights. Yeah. Those, that's what he likes. And he, and it's a lot of it is practical, which going into it, I was also a little bit nervous about because there's so many practical lights in the scene and you don't want it to be just little bitty hot spots everywhere in a really dark scene. Like I can't mm -hmm. see their faces, but I can see speckled lights everywhere. So trying to find a way to make sure they were being lit as well as the environment being lit was my concern at the beginning. But honestly, there was so many <laughs> practical lights. We usually had at least some exposure wherever we were at. And then it was about going in with our movie lights just to shape things. Mm -hmm. So uh, like, and we were also handheld and we were also shooting 360 a lot of times. You're like, you start here, then you're panning over here. So you're hiding lights is, ends up being an art form into itself, just trying to find a way <laughs> not to see the movie lights, even though they're sitting right next to the camera. All right. Um, so we did a lot of that as well. Like trying to just trying to figure out how to mix movie colored movie lights in with Christmas lights to make them look like they're just part of the location and not something they're getting blasted by. I mean, I don't necessarily, I was, I was reading this, this, uh, this book um, about Nestor uh, Al Alamendros and he was talking about just natural lighting um, and how he <laughs> likes, likes to make it look like what it would really look like. And if it doesn't, then he just, bumps up a little bit, but where you never, you never, you never think about where the light source is coming from. And I used to be very, very, uh, stuck on that idea. Um, and then I, and then I was like, I actually don't like, I like Darius Kanji and I like people who just put the light in the frame. And if it looks nice, that's what we're going to do. And so in this one, we were able to do some of that. Sometimes there is lighting that is not justified at all. Like it's, I don't know where it's coming from, but it was, it felt mm -hmm. right. So that's what we leaned into. And the world just kept, keeps getting crazier and crazier as the movie goes on. I really felt like we weren't in a world where I needed to justify stuff. So True. there, there are moments where there's lights coming from places that shouldn't have lights, but they do. And I thought it looked <laughs> nice. So we just left them there. That's funny. Now, where, where was it filmed? Where did you guys shoot? Uh, in central central California, we were just outside of Sacramento in a town called Placerville for the second half of the movie. So we started in uh, Pollock Pines. So Pollock Pines is, I guess, maybe an hour and a half from Sacramento up in the mountains, which is where uh, Tori's house is. So there's Tori's house and then the duplicate house, which all with all the Christmas lights on it. And they needed two houses side by side that you could see one through the window of the other because mm -hmm. of the whole kid getting killed. They needed to be able to see into the other house. Right. Um, th this was, this one wasn't perfect and we actually had to flop the interior. So from the outside, the Christmas house is on the right. Tori's house is on the left. When we did the interiors, we had to flop the interior. So we actually used the Christmas house's interior for Tori's house and we use this Tori's house's interiors for the inside of the Christmas house just because of the way people needed to be looking. Interesting. So what was the weather at the time? When, when were you guys filming this? Uh, it was February. So we got there and there was snow. Then we started shooting and then there was no snow. So we had to bring everything in. Wow. Um, but it so was we got a bunch of snow there. machines and all that. Yeah, but that was another thing. It was not in the original. I mean, snow on the ground was what we wanted, mm -hmm. uh, but it snowing was not necessarily in the script until the special effects people got there and we were talking. 
And I was telling Joe about like we wanted to do atmosphere, like smoke outside. So some about these things called tubes of death, which are just big tubes that you put a smoke machine into and you can circle houses with them or football fields, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Whenever there's night stuff and you see fog, it's because of these tubes. They run them all over the place to cover large areas. So we go to look at that, but they also have these snow machines we go to look at and Joe falls in love with them immediately. So it's like, it's now snowing. Every exterior scene is snowing, which turned into a whole, whole fiasco, but we got it. It ended up working out. But anyway, so yeah, it was snowing when we got there and it was like, great, it's snowing. And it immediately quit snowing and never snowed again after that. Um, and it was just very cold and it was on a hill. So I was, when we didn't, once you get up to the hill and up to the houses, it wasn't that bad, but standing on uneven ground all day, I kept relating it to being in the desert. Even if you're not doing much, if you're getting hit with wind all day long, it's just mm -hmm. exhausting. True. Standing on the side of a, on, on, on a, on a, a driveway with an incline all day long is just tiring because you're not standing normally. You're always kind of trying to keep your footing. Um, so it was, it was a pretty rough location after a while but we were there for three weeks and after that we moved to pollock pines or we moved to placerville and that's where we shot the bulk of like the toy store and the record store police station all the car stunts all that stuff was done and we were shooting overnights we would get there around five or six every day and we would shoot till five in the morning five or six in the morning mm -hmm. um once the sun came up we had to quit so every night we would get there and we would set up and then the sun would go down and the place was we we had people to help shut down the streets but a lot if we needed to but a lot of times there just weren't that many people there so it wow. was like a weird back lot where we just had the main street of placerville to run up and down seemed like a perfect location yeah and you know yeah. i was thinking about the christmas lights too like what did you just raid walmart or target or something and buy up all the christmas lights that they had <laughs> yeah well i mean when i got there they had already started working on it but um um um, they had, they went, they, well, they just talked to the city and talked to the businesses and the business were like, sure. Yeah. Whatever you want to do. So they just had tons and tons of lights and they just, just strung them up and just strung them up. They were on roofs. They were like, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't get to see a lot of this work being done because we were mostly in one of the locations shooting. Um, they were, uh, the, the downside is they were only a little bit ahead of us. So while we're at the record store, they're in the toy store decorating. Mm -hmm. When we're in the toy store and we're about to be going outside, they're out on Main Street decorating Main Street. So um, they're they're dressing as we're shooting. So I didn't really get to see a lot of the work being done. I would just show up and like, oh, now there's it was done. Main, yeah. Main Street is, is Christmas. But it was cool because we saw um, we saw photos of what they actually do for Christmas. And what we did was very, very similar. I mean, we missed some of we missed some of their. Um, annual decorations that they do but the way that they do it was very similar and to the way that we did it so if you go to placerville you'll get to see the christmas buddy christmas christmas okay. yeah i recognize this yeah oh that's right it's in the movie yeah. um what do you what is it about you know there's there's this continuing popularity of this genre and i can remember the very first film i snuck into as a kid was silent night deadly night in, in 1984 I never forget that. Um, and one of the one of the first interviews Mike and I did was with another cinematographer, Johnny Durango, who worked on Fat Man. I don't know if you saw that film with Mel Gibson, and um, and then there's this Violent Night film that just came out, and Black Christmas. You know, the, on and on. It's a long list, but what is it about the like Christmas horror? <laughs> you know, what, I what is the attraction there? Uh, is it the I, juxtaposition of I, I was about to say i mean i know? think that that's what it is i mean uh i mean national lampoon's christmas vacation is great but i mean there's just there's just i think it's just subverting subverting yeah. the the holiday um because like the christmas lights we're all led to believe that they're safe and right. it's fun to play with the the expectation that maybe they're not and i know like a few years ago all the um Krampus stuff started coming out. Krampus, that, right. That, that's been around for years, hundreds of years. That's been a legend. Um, but it would just be fell out of popularity. And then it came back and like, oh, we already have this built-in 
negative aspect to Christmas? Like who who leaves the switches? I mean, oh, I mean, I guess Santa Claus leaves the switches, but uh, I mean, like there is a sense of punishment for not doing the right thing. And people are like, you know what? We haven't really talked about the punishment aspect of Christmas yet. Well, not you about. you mentioned earlier uh, the scene in the, in the film. Uh, if if those who haven't seen it, spoiler alert. So make sure you know. <laughs> Go watch it. Come back and listen to the podcast. The killing of kids in the film. Now, I can, Mike and I talked about, I think it's when we saw the first of David Gordon Green's Halloweens uh-huh. in 2018. And kid gets whacked in that film. Yeah. It's pretty rare that you see that, like, you know, a real, a younger kid, not teenagers like Friday 13th or whatever. But yeah. was that, right from the get-go in the script that that was going to happen or cause that, uh, that well, has to be a very specific choice you're going to make. Cause you know, yeah. it's either going to turn people off or, you know, well in the script, the kid gets killed and, and when okay. we shot it, it was implied that he got killed, but we had to do reshoots uh, or pickups because so the head stomp when, when Matt Mercer gets oh. his head stomped on the, on the stairs, we shot that so many times cause they just couldn't the, in the script, it says, Head splits in half, teeth go flying. It's nasty. So we we shot it and it didn't work. And we shot it again and it didn't work. It's just the head didn't snap the right way. It wasn't right. supposed to be schoolish. It was supposed to like bones flying everywhere. So we kept shooting it. And as a result, we had to shoot it again. So we built these stairs to do that. But when we did that, we were like, well, what else can we do while we're here? And Joe decided that he wanted to actually split the kid in half. So they <laughs> built, I mean, it's in the, in the movie for like a, a split second, um, yeah. but they have built this little kid and put the pajamas on him. And then we chop like he gets hit and chops him in half. Um, and I mean, the kid always died in the script, but I didn't expect to see it. I don't think we had ever planned to actually see the kid getting chopped. Yeah. Um, I wonder, you know, maybe for it until the pickups. Well, maybe it's got something to do with, uh, I don't know if it's Joe. Somebody doesn't like a Christmas story, clearly. And maybe it was like vicariously killing Ralphie or something because a lot of, I'm like, I guess I'm a D bag now because I watch a Christmas story every year. I'm one of those people. So it's, I mean, someone doesn't like a Christmas story. (laughs) Well, what's funny is, I mean, Joe likes everything. I mean, that guy is, he, yeah. He is like an encyclopedia of movies. Um, I just think he... I, it was fun I think, poking fun at it. Yeah, I think he just wanted to make sure no one turned away or that people felt like they needed to if they, if they were adverse to child murder. Now, it's interesting because uh, you got... Yeah, adverse. Yeah, because there's that <laughs> faction of people that are not. You're right. It's, <laughs> it's, okay. Um, uh, Abraham Ben Ruby plays Santa. Uh-huh. It was so wild because Mike and I remember him. Our earliest memory I can think of is when he was on the show, Parker Lewis can't lose. Uh-huh. I mean, that goes way back to like 1990, but he's in one of my favorite films, which is open range with Kevin Costner oh, yeah. and, and Robert Duvall. He played, I think the character named Moose in, in that film, but yeah. um, that was an interesting choice. And um, of course, uh, uh, Riley Dandy and Sam, is it Sam Delich? Who play, okay, I love the character names, you know, uh, the the uh, Tory Toombs, Robbie Reynolds, like, and wasn't even yeah. Joe, wasn't he like Benny the Boozer or something? Uh, Benny, <laughs> Benny Barnes. Benny Barnes. Oh, so, oh, man, that was, I, I was, so I knew in the script it's that way. And he kept, Joe would just sit there and crack himself up trying to come up with more names for people. Was that, was there any specific reason or rationale behind that or just funny i don't think so i think he just yeah. thought it was funny and he also thought it pissed off josh so he would keep coming up with names and trying to fit in new characters that had alliterated names right and josh would just go we can't call him that you can't that can't be their name and then joe would laugh and then we would get a new page the next day with a new person and they would have another alliterated name um so I think he, I mean, I, I, you know, I've never asked you about, but um, I know from being there, I think he just did it to amuse himself. Well, I know that uh, it wasn't lost on me uh, either that 
Joe or made, I don't know, I'm assuming it was his decision. He makes himself the police sergeant. Cause you see that scene where Riley oh, yeah. is standing outside the door and you see very subtle, but it's there. I'm like, I, I got you. I see you. Oh, yeah. That was pretty. Well, his, his, dad also, his dad's also the ambulance driver. Oh, is he? Oh, I didn't know that. I, okay. I, I kept, I would start my scene on his dad and then I would whip over to what the action is hoping that his dad would get a little more screen time. Um, <laughs> but no, but when, uh, when they catch Riley and they're dragging her back and there's an ambulance next to the cop car, the ambulance is the ambulance driver is Joe's dad. So oh, that's wild. Yeah, there's, there's Vegas is all over that movie. Now I don't, do you know how uh, Jeff Daniel Phillips comes to be in the film? Because it was, I was like, Oh wow. I mean, that's a, that's a big get, especially in the genre. And he was uh, so memorable in Rob Zombie's Halloween too. Yeah. Uh, and of course he's in the monsters too. He's kind of one of his players that, you know, he turns to, like you said, Joe does with a lot of his players. So how does he come? Do you know how does he get cast? I think that the, Joe, they had just met before. Um, Joe, Joe works a lot. Like I said, he works with his friends a lot and he likes to work with people he's already worked with. And, um, so the only people that were new that I know of were Riley and Sam. I know he cast them and he was looking at a bunch of different people. Yeah. And he cast them for this. Um, Abe, Abe, he had worked with before. I think that they met because they had mutual friends and he had a small part in bliss, which is how he met Abe. Um, and then Jeff, I think that just through the industry and horror films and stuff mm. like that, I think that they had met at some point and, and he tried to get him for other stuff, but it just never worked out until until we did this one um, because he only came in for just a little while to do the police station, and he has that small part at the bar as well. Yeah, he's uh, he's great. He's got. A, I mean, he seems. I, I guess he's. I would assume he's a huge. He's a pretty big guy. It looks like so. Yeah, he's yeah, got he's that presence cool. about him. You know. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was intentional, I'm assuming, but so many, you know, as I'm watching it, it just, it brings up so, thoughts of so many other films. There seems to be so many intentional, or unintentional influences, uh, you know, everything from Halloween to The Shining to Terminator to you name it. Uh, yeah. I mean, was that, were some of those things intentional homages to some of the, film, to some of the films that Joe or you guys love or? Yeah, there were a handful of ones that Joe was particularly interested in, but we watched a lot of we watched a lot of stuff just partly to so I could get my head into Joe's space mm. like, to understand what what he was seeing and what he wanted. Um, um, but I think from an action standpoint and also for framing purposes and some of the lighting stuff, like hardware was a pretty big one. Terminator obviously obviously was a big one. Um, but like I said, Joe just, I mean, he watches movies nonstop. I mean, he is just an avid, he, he loves film. And, and so I'm sure there's a lot that seeped in that he wasn't even aware of that you could probably draw parallels to. Yeah. But, uh, there were no points that I can remember where he's like, I want to do this shot, like this shot from this other movie. Right. There were versions where we're like, here's an example of a shot I want to do from another movie. And then we ended up either through limitations or location or just geography ours ended up being slightly different but um like the step off scene um mm -hmm. there there's a there's a handful of people that have done those but um ours didn't look like that didn't like that look like theirs just because of the geography of the buildings and where our character needed to be and what the actual movement was going to be but we knew we wanted to do a steady cam step off to a long one or through the through the record store and so we looked at films that did those to figure out what made them successful and how we could utilize that for our movie but i can't think of any like there's no parts where like this is a a, a purpose purposeful head nod mm -hmm. or anything like that yeah well it's almost cooler that it's just like you said it seeps in you know, it's just, it's in your DNA almost. So it, it's, it's bound to come out. You did a fantastic job on, on the look of the film. I mean, it really, even you get that sense, even just looking at the poster for, it, you know, that, that kind of vibe. And I like, what I liked was it had a very retro feel, but it, it was clearly 
contemporary because a lot of the references that were being made, you know, Tinder and some of these other things yeah. that were mentioned in the film. And I thought that was pretty cool. It's definitely, um, there's some intense scenes, you know, it's graphic, uh, you know, some, you know, I'm sure it's gotta be awkward to film some of those scenes where there's, you know, the sexual stuff going on and <laughs> that's gotta be awkward for everybody involved, but yeah. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been on some of those where it is very awkward. Ours was not that bad. It was just me and Joe. Oh, okay. And we, we, it's, I mean, it's practically mostly lit with just practicals in the room. And then I had like one lighting setup that we had to move around, but we went in and, uh, it was just he and I and, and, uh, Riley and Sam. And I think it, I mean, I, You'd have to, I guess, talk to them about that too. I mean, I think maybe it started. Yeah. It started a little. I mean, it's it's a weird thing to do. Yeah. But as soon as we got going, and you have to do it over again, then you do it over again, and then you do it over again, and then he, they're making out and they knock everything over, and then we got to do it again. So then Art runs in, and the actors are helping them put the CD shelf back together. Right. And just doing it over and over again. I mean, there is. I think that they're like Riley is very exposed. Sam's very exposed, but I think it becomes normalized in some way through repetition. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being a really fun scene. And it's one of my favorites from a lighting standpoint, because when it goes into slow motion, it's a very erotic scene, which is what it's supposed to be. It is these undulating lights, which are supposed to be the Christmas lights from outside the window which we actually had to bring into the room to really get the blind effect right on right. them and getting this like weird um, pinkish color of the room, purplish pink color room with red and orange or red and green um, moving over undulating over them while they're making out. I just think that that's some of the, some of the really cool things like image image wise that I'm really proud of that we did. And it was just me and Joe, Joe operating me pulling focus for Joe. And I'm a horrible focus puller. And, <laughs> and then in between takes me tweaking lights and all of us running around trying to reset the room just so they can get back into it. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a weird one, but I also think it was, it's from a photograph. I mean, from a, just a, from a scene, I'm proud of the work that we did because it, it feels hot, which is what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's an art to do that. They can be sex scenes can be very clumsy sometimes and not erotic at all. Mm -hmm. And when you have something where it's supposed to be juxtapositioning a child being murdered across the street, I mean, it, it's got to, it's got to hit um, on its own. So there's, that was, I thought that was one of the kind of an, an interesting scene and in the way we did it was, was, was fun too. Yeah, no, it, it, it worked out well. I, I also love the fact that it's just under like a 90 minute film. It's so hard to find that nowadays, you know, everything's yeah. two plus, you know, and it's, it's sometimes it's tough to digest, but um, it, 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 that was nice as well. So talk about, uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but um, what do you got coming up? You know, what, what other projects are you working on? And then, you know, let folks know how they can, find you and follow you and kind of keep tabs on you uh i honestly don't have anything right now i have a, Ooh, a little break okay yeah i have a music video that i'm finishing up um which is just kind of a personal project um one of the guys from my band uh, everybody in the band is in 10 bands so the, the, right. one of the guys is in another band and i uh got this eight millimeter camera i wanted to play with so i told him i'd make a music video so i have a reason to mess with this eight millimeter camera so I'm doing that, but other than that, just uh, just kicking it around the house. Uh, I was on, uh, like I said, I was on 1923, and they have more to shoot. The whole Tyler Sheridan world is massive, mm. so I'm hoping maybe I can pick up more of that in the coming year because they have a bunch of shows, um, and it's just nice doing stuff like that. Allows me to take on smaller movies. Mm -hmm. um, um, Joe, I think, has stuff coming up this year. I have another director, Jaron Louder, that I work with. I think he has stuff coming up this year. But everything's like TBD. I don't, I don't know exactly when it's going to go. It could be where I'll have months of planning, or mm -hmm. they'll call me tomorrow and go, "Hey, uh, in two weeks we have to fly to Seattle." I, yeah, I just, I'm not really sure. So. Nature of the biz. Yeah. Yeah. So where, uh, where, where are you most active? Is it on Instagram or where can people look you up? Yeah. I, yeah, I don't, I have all the other ones. I just don't really utilize them that much. I'm, I'm mostly on, on Instagram. And what's your handle there? 
uh, just BW Sowell. Okay. We'll put that up on the, on the screen here too. Brian, it's been great talking to you. You know, I, I, again, I always love sort of getting the, the education of the art and kind of what goes on, you know, cause I think no matter what the film is, you just, folks just don't really have a sense of really all that goes into, to making a film like this. And so, um, appreciate the insight, hope that, uh, you know, we can get you back on next year, you know, and, and talk yeah. some more, but, uh, it's been a pleasure. Now, if you have to choose music or film, which way are you going? Probably film. I mean, that's, that's what actually pays my really. Bill. Okay. Well, it's interesting because you've got behind you for those that are watching the podcast, you got this extraordinary vinyl collection going on. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. These are movies that afford me to have a, a record collection. So yeah, it's nice, nice <laughs> to see that, you know, the, like, speaking of retro, right? Well, yeah. I mean, there's still artists putting out vinyl today. Yeah. What there's is it? The 180, wall. yeah. The 180 gram vinyl or whatever, you know, yeah. I'm not a vinyl uh, connoisseur, but I've got a few of my collection. So, but thanks for giving, giving us your time, Brian, really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, hope you have a good rest of your holiday and a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care.